You think, I'm going to nail this sermon. This is great. And then when you do the sermon, it kind of goes, hmm, okay. And then other times, you struggle with the sermon and putting it together. And people come to you and say, man, that was really good today. And you go, hmm, okay. Um, I wasn't thinking it was going to be that good. And so today is one of those days where I really struggled with this thing. I don't know why I struggled with it so hard, but um, it was just not coming, not coming, and I was praying about it and everything. But I think it's come together okay, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> I hope you're encouraged. The people of Jacob, otherwise named Israel, went out of Egypt during, or went, sorry, down to Egypt during a famine in the land because God had sent Joseph ahead of them in preparation for this. And they were in Egypt some 430 years and enjoyed some pretty good times and, and some very bad times, were under um, different pharaohs. Some treated them okay and some just abused them. And if you think about it, as the generations came and went, 430 years is a lot of time to program the way people think, to program their expectations, and a whole gamut of emotions that goes along with all of that. Perhaps they fell into a mode of just getting through each day, only to struggle through the next one, which became the norm for them. One of the consistent things about human nature is to grumble when things aren't in our favor or things aren't going the way I'd like them to go or I expect them to go. Or maybe even someone believes something I don't believe. These Israelites were groaning and crying out for help because of their slavery and the excessive workload and abuse by the Egyptians. God heard their groanings and he took notice and so he does what he always does by showing them mercy and he decides that he would rescue his people from that slavery in Egypt. And so he prepares Moses and he sends him to the Pharaoh and demands their release from slavery and eventually through a number of different things he takes them out of the land of slavery. As you read that account in scripture you can't help but notice the likeness it has to the Christian salvation in Christ, the deliverance from slavery. The only difference is our slavery was slavery to sin. We grow up, sin creeps into our lives, and like Paul tells us, this happens to everyone. Everyone sinned and falls short of the glory of God. And so this happens to be the best and worst of us. And as we become enslaved and over time our minds and our hearts are programmed with ideas and, and practices and desires and, and justifications and all of these things and the emotions that go along with that. And sometimes we get to the place where we are groaning under the load of sin in our life and, it, and what we're enslaved to and we want a way out. We're seeking a way out and God says... I've got the way for you. He's there and has provided a rescue for us from that slavery of sin and to have a relationship with him again. And he takes us by the hand out of the domain of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of his beloved son, Colossians 1.13. And so God knows our plight of slavery to sin. And if we call out to him, he will hear our groanings and he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, for that very purpose, to rescue us from our sinful slave, our slavery to sin and lead us to the promised land in heaven with him. And so this morning we're going to look at a passage of scripture that you should all be very familiar with because we've just read it not so long ago. It's Exodus chapter 16. The Israelites had to learn how to walk with God. They were in slavery for 430 years and they didn't have the mental fortitude or the obedience to God that they needed. And so God was going to train them up along the way. And, and part of that training involved testing. So let's look at this. Would you agree that with God you have to have a, a, a strong 
mental fortitude, a strong mind and a strong heart for him? I think you do. You see, after the firstborn of Egypt had been killed, Pharaoh couldn't get Israel out of Egypt quick enough. I mean, Pharaoh, in a moment of grief and terror, realizes he's no match for God, that the God that he's been defying. And so he wanted nothing more to do with God or his people. Yet, after Israel left, he hardened his heart once more. And he chased after them, and he caught up to them at the edge of the Red Sea. What do you suppose the Israelites did? Oh yeah, they did what they always do. They grumbled and they cried out against Moses. And they said, why have you brought us out here to die in a desert and where there's no graves? And Moses looks at them, and I can imagine he shakes his head, but he says, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. And he did. He parted that Red Sea and they walked through on dry ground safely and God drowned all the Egyptians in Exodus chapter 14. The ten plagues in Egypt, this event at the Red Sea, and many other miracles that God performed for Israel was not for his own health or well-being. It was for the benefit of the people of Israel to educate them on who he was and to put their faith in him and to trust him. He wanted them to know and understand that they were walking with the God of heaven. They were worshiping the God of heaven. They were trust, they should be trusting in him. God wanted them to have a change of mind. He wanted their minds to change, reconfigure how they thought about things, how they reasoned through things, and, and how things were actually done. You see, because they kind of relied on Pharaoh for their life, for eating and all of that stuff. And God wanted them to rely on him instead. He wanted them to develop a mental toughness in him, knowing that he was the one that was in control of all things. He had broken their chains of slavery and freedom. He had pulled a liquid gap out of the belching Red Sea and allowed them to go through on dry land. But the people were slow to get it. They were hard-hearted, is what he called them. They were looking one way and moving another way. They were thinking one way and their minds were in another place. They were trying to walk with God in the wilderness, but their minds were still back in Egypt. And James says, that's double-minded. They started out watching God as he beckoned them through the cloud by day and the fire by night. But at the same time in their minds, they were still holding on to the Pharaoh's hand and their minds were stuck back in Egypt. Literally, they were walking free from Egyptian slavery because God had delivered them and the chains of Egyptian slavery still held sway over them. It's a terrible situation. Well, you've probably figured it out that they weren't so different from so many Christians today. Too many Christians are still hung up on the slavery of their past life that God has rescued them from to properly enjoy the freedom in Christ. They never get there, it seems like some. Every time Israel faced a challenge, their immediate response was to grumble. That is quite normal for slaves to do. They forgot that they were walking with God, and so they decided to grumble and complain instead of calling on the Lord and allowing him to fix the problem for them, and they could move on with joy and peace. We all know the person who claims to walk with Christ Jesus today, who at the first inclination of struggle or controversy begin to grumble and complain. I know that because I've done it myself. And probably if we were honest with ourselves, most of us would say that at some time we've done that. But we don't have to become stuck there. We can get free of that and put our faith in God, walk with him, let him work things out to the good for those who love him. And, and, and so when we are caught between the Red Sea in our life and the enemy's attack, we too should not fear. We should stand firm and watch the salvation of the Lord. See, God toughens us up mentally in him through his word if we abide in it.
And so the first thing that we can learn from Israel's plight and flight is to truly leave our slavery behind, leave our past behind, and make sure we're looking forward and that we're walking in step with God. You all know that God tests us, right? James tells us that. Hebrews 3.8 tells us, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, uh, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. You see, I, I, I tried to figure this out one time, how long it would have taken them to go from Egypt through the Red Sea to Mount Sinai up to Palestine and be on the border knocking on the door of the Promised Land. Probably it would have taken them about three weeks, maybe a little bit longer. That's all the journey was. And they got to the Promised Land and they said, whoa, they're giants, we can't do this. Well, of course they couldn't do it, but God could. But they forgot about that. You see, you see the problem that's reoccurring here? So this, this passage in Hebrews in re, is in reference to different times that Israel um, really didn't listen to God in the wilderness. And they paid for it. God has always allowed testing or tested his people concerning their faithfulness towards him and his commandments. It is interesting as we read through the 40-year journey in the wilderness just how many times Israel failed that test. But we don't want to be too hard on them. Trust me. We, looked at, we look at their reaction when Pharaoh came up behind them at the Red Sea. All they, needed, all they did was grumble. When Moses couldn't feed them, all they did was grumble. When they didn't have water, they grumbled. When they got to the promised land, the guys were too big and they couldn't do it. And, and you just go through all of it and it's like, where's God in this equation? He wasn't there in their minds. The test was to see if they would put their faith in God to deliver them from their perils and to protect them just as he did with Pharaoh when he broke the chains of slavery. There were more tests in the wilderness. The Passover and Exodus from Egypt was on the 14th day of the first month, Exodus 12. And their months were a few days longer than ours, the Jewish months. And so now it is the 15th day of the second month, Exodus 16, verse 1. They grumbled to Moses because there's no bread to eat. Now, this is the first mention in about five or six weeks of walking now that they're grumbling about bread. Think about that. You think that uh, the unleavened bread that they had made in Egypt lasted them six weeks? Maybe. Maybe not. But it's not unfathomable to, to believe that God sustained them without anything. He could just sustain them in the wilderness. Because think of this. Deuteronomy tells us that in the in the want the 40 years of wandering, their clothes never wore out, their sandals never wore off of their feet. So God could sustain them. But it, it, it's kind of like human nature, I guess. We want to see that physical part. We don't, we don't want to just go, wow, we're doing great. God's looking after me. I don't need anything. We don't want to do that. We want to be the ones looking after ourselves and making sure we're okay and all of that kind of thing. And so they failed the test. They were not content in the way God was doing things. Um, it's kind of like Saul when he was king. You and I want to be careful that we don't get drawn into that rut in our lives. It isn't any stretch to think or figure out that these things can and do happen to us today, even with all the blessings of Christ that we have. See, there's a heavy wagon that was being pulled down a country road by a team of oxen, and as they moved along that road, the axles groaned and the wheels creaked, and it was a terrible noise, and the oxen turned and they said to the wagon, they said, why do you make so much noise? We are the ones that are doing all the work. 
we should be the ones that are crying out. Too often in the church, those who complain and grumble are the ones who have the least to do. They're the ones, um, I'll, I'll put it this way, the gift of grumbling is often uh, dispensed by those who do little or nothing and keep their talents wrapped up in a napkin, nice and tidy. It's interesting how for some, God just isn't doing enough, while for others, God has done immeasurably more than we deserve, than we can even be thankful for. He's done so much for us. He's blessed us so much. You know what it comes down to? It comes down to your mental well-being with God and your heart for God. What we want to make sure of is that um, we're not just looking like Christians and having our mind somewhere else back in our previous life. What we want to make sure is that we're walking in step with Jesus, that we're holding his hand like we're saying, and that we're walking in step with him. We're not running ahead of him. We're not running behind him. And so the second thing we learn from Israel's plight and flight is to make sure that we are walking with God and not dragging behind or running ahead, just staying in step. And all of this really boils down or hinges on this concept of obedience to God. The scripture talks a lot about God wanting our hearts because that is the key to having the rest of us, our minds, our desires, our soul, our worship, our faithfulness, everything. If he's got our heart, he's got all of those things. And so we're talking here about obedience to God's word or his commandments. They grumbled and God laid down manna for them to eat. Now think about this. It says it tasted sweet. And so when I read that, I always think about the sweet rolls that my mother made, they were so good. And I think that maybe it tasted like that. But they are told to gather an omer per person, which is really about four pounds each day. Don't keep it around. Make sure you eat it, because don't keep it around till the next day. Well, there were those that said, you know what, I'm going to save a little bit up for tomorrow just in case it doesn't come down tomorrow from heaven. And they woke up in the morning and there were worms in it and it stank. And I think they probably said, oh, now I know why you don't keep it. Then there, there were others. They say, He said, well, you know, you're going to keep the seventh day holy. You're going to set it apart. And, and it's a rest day and there's no work to be done. And so... On the seventh day, or on the sixth day, you gather up two omers each. And on that day, the leftover will be okay for the seventh day. And there were people that didn't believe that. And so on the seventh day, they went out, and guess what? No bread had came down from heaven. There was nothing there for them to gather. And, and, and this, this is how the people were. They, they just didn't listen. Now the Lord was not pleased with all of this, and so he said to Moses, he said, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? So again, you see that Israel just wasn't getting the point that they needed to be obedient to God. They needed to worship him for all he did for them and who he was. You see, God wants all of us, his children, his offspring, his redeemed. He wants us to be faithful to him, to listen to him, and you say, well, why do I have to listen to God? Well, let's see. He created us. He probably knows better than we do what's best for us. He probably knows how we should live life. We don't know that. We just kind of guess as we go along the road. And so, yeah, obedience to him would be very important. And Israel never got that completely. And guess what happened to Israel? They became a byword amongst the nations. Do you know what that is? They were dispersed amongst the nations and the nation of the Jews no longer existed at one point, basically. Today, we don't have to look back to Israel to see disobedience. All we have to do is look in our own backyard. And there are so many things that people are doing their way rather than God's. And, and, and what this does is it confuses people and it bewilders people. 
You believe what you want to believe, and I'm going to believe what I want to believe, and nothing's mentioned about what God wants us to believe. It, it, it's how it works. And, and, and so we have, we have it all written here for us, but we don't always listen to it. And so I often wonder, what would Jesus say if Jesus were to walk in through those doors right here today? What would he say? It's something to think about. He surprised the Jews and might surprise us as well. Here is the matter of it all. Disobedience is the ultimate disrespect to God. It is the ultimate irreverence for God. And it is the ultimate spit in his face denial of God. You might as well, if you're going to do that, you might as well have been at the cross and spit on Jesus. Israel, when they were at Mount Sinai, showed that they were walking in the wilderness, but their mind and their actions were still back in Egypt. Moses didn't come down off the mountain as they thought he should or when they thought he should. And they said, man, he's been up there too long. Something's happened to him, and he's not coming back. And guess what they did? What was the old mindset? Oh, let's melt down all our jewelry, and let's make a golden calf to worship. God had just led them out of all of that. But guess where their minds were? That is straight out of the Egyptians' book of gods and worship. You might ask how that could possibly happen after witnessing all of the plagues and the power of God separating the sea and saving them and the other miracles he did. Well, it's not so hard when your mind's not focused properly on him. They were still back in Egypt. They were not walking with God as, as they should. They were either dragging behind or they were getting ahead of them. And they were just hoping to find something better than Egypt. But they didn't realize that they already had something far better than Egypt. They were living it right then and there. If only they had opened their eyes and their hearts. And so the third thing that we learn from Egypt's plight and flight is that God has the best for us. And in return, all he wants is our faithfulness and our obedience to him. You see, Israel didn't give their hearts and their minds over to God. And so they didn't realize what they had, who it was that they were, want, that they were walking with, and who was providing for them. They needed to change their thinking, their allegiance. They needed to change from Egyptian slavery to service in God's kingdom with God. And their allegiance had a switch from the gods of Egypt to the God of heaven. But they struggled with that, even though God gave them more than necessary for them to put their faith in him. He gave them so many things. What would you do if you just saw 10 miracles happen in the next two weeks? right in front of your eyes. Would that not do something to you? Man. So therefore, instead of having a blessed and peaceful walk with God, one that was fruitful and rewarding, they floundered and they stumbled and they went through unnecessary pain and persecution and struggles. None of that was necessary had they simply put their faith in God and obeyed him. Instead, they missed out on the promised land and they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Not a blessed state for those who call themselves the people of God. Conversely, you and I, if we are Christians, if we are blessed to be in Christ Jesus, having our sins washed away and being raised to live a new life in him, we have it all. Just like Israel did, and perhaps even more. To have that and keep that, however, we need to have a change of mind and heart from where we were to where we are now in Christ. We must leave the tumultuous slavery of sin, not be back there with it in our minds and our desires, but walking with Jesus in step with him, not behind or ahead, but in step with him, walking peacefully in obedience to him. Too many Christians, instead uh, of having that peaceful and blessed walk, 
with Jesus, a fruitful and rewarding walk, they flounder and they stumble and they go through all kinds of unnecessary pain and struggles because they got two minds. They're sort of with Jesus. They're sort of in the past. You got to let it go. You have to be faithful and obedient to the Lord and to the Lord only and walk with him hand in hand, in step with him according to his will, according to what he wants you to believe and desire. And so I encourage you this morning to make sure to walk in step with Jesus. There's nothing better in this life, in this world. And if you've not begun that walk with Jesus, well, we can help you if you want help with that walk. If you're struggling in that walk, we can help you with that as well. All we say is that you can let us know by coming forward while we stand and sing.